I'm not worried about Chat GPT outsmarting humans. When I look at something like industry creative, it's about the body of work that this person has done in their past. You have had this on and off relationship with Python and, right, and coding. Yeah. So if you were going to start the relationship again, what yeah. would you ask it? Womp, womp, womp. Mm. It does not work out of the box. Who says tech can't be human? What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to the show. Glad to be back again in our beautiful studio, mm -hmm. trying out this beautiful new desk. It's yeah. So clean. You so can eat clean. off of it. It's beautiful. I mean, you, you, we got books, we got <laughs> drinks, we got mics, we got everything we need right here, just in this little area. And we're talking about looking so beautiful here in our studio because we are doing this in person again. Yep. We have a video component. You can watch every episode going forward on YouTube and even stream it on your favorite podcasting platform. 100%. Yeah, we had to give it a little bit extra, right? Right. Uh, because, I mean, come on, you're a good looking guy and <laughs> I can look decent when I actually get dressed. But I think that we had to bring this to everybody out there. Right. And not only did we have to bring this video to everyone out there, but we were like, you know what? There's all these things that you can do with video when you have a video podcast, right. like bring in new technology, show off new technology. But we decided to bring in a technology that you can see, but you can also listen to. A hundred percent. And that's why I'm so excited that we're doing this episode today. I've been down a rabbit hole for the past like several weeks. Like I'm sure a lot of people around the world are right. when it comes to chat GPT. There are so many things you can do from a personal perspective and even a professional perspective. But I think it's really, really going to be useful for people in cybersecurity. What exactly is ChatGPT? I, I use it all the time. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that I know that use it, but there's also a lot of people that have never even heard of ChatGPT. So ChatGPT was created by OpenAI, and they built this natural language processor, basically an AI algorithm that took in a bunch of information, like a ridiculous amount of information, then can act as a chatbot for someone. So you could ask it questions. You can right. say, what is cybersecurity? And it will spit it out. You can even do something like act as if you're this person. You could be someone that's famous. Pretend you're Bruce Lee or pretend that you are a person that's looking to buy hairspray. And I am a hairspray advertiser. And you could have it spit out as much as you really want. I think there's some limitations. I think the data cutoff for the, at least this iteration was 2021. But uh, still, just from a base, uh, it's a powerful weapon. So the limitation are you saying is uh, the amount of characters that you can add in? What is the limitation? There's a couple of limitations. So there's limitations on input. If the input's too long, it just can't do it. They do have another iteration of ChatGPT coming out, which is supposedly like exponentially Chat bigger. ChatGPT Pro as well. Right, and ChatGPT Pro. But there is a limit for input and there is a limit for output. Sometimes if the output's too long, it'll just stop the output. Uh, the other thing I will recommend for anybody out there that's going to use this, don't use like your personal information and <laughs> definitely don't use corporate information and trusting it to a, a third party app like that. So just that warning. You know, when I first learned about ChatGPT was actually through you, mm -hmm. uh, but I had heard and used GPT, OpenAI's GPT model in the past about a year ago. And I remember talking to a few people about it and they were like, cool, you know, you put in a prompt and it gives you information back. Right. But during the time when I first used it, they didn't have all of the use cases on such a beautiful display. Mm -hmm. When I went to chat GPT, one of the first things that I did was I took a podcast episode transcript mm -hmm. and I said, hey, write me show notes from this episode transcript. Right. We were talking about it. I was like, I can't stand writing show notes. They're so <laughs> important because they, they give you the bio about right. the episode, about the background of our guests. Mm -hmm. But why not enlist a little bit of help from someone that can look at the transcript and yeah. summarize it for you? A hundred percent. And, you know, we'll sit in meetings and we'll be talking about, oh, how do we put this together? And I'm like, y'all, chat GPT. <laughs> like, I'm telling you, it's a cheat code when it comes to either distilling information or even expanding information. Right. So I think today, I think would be really, really cool to take everyone through some use cases on how to use ChatGPT for cybersecurity, mm -hmm. maybe some content, 
and maybe have a little fun too. Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. I will share my screen out and we'll also talk through everything that we're doing for the listeners only. Um, but we have chat GPT pulled up here. Let's give mm -hmm. it a softball. Very easy softball. What is cybersecurity? Let's see what it says. All right. It says cybersecurity is the practice of protecting internet connected systems, including hardware, software, and data from attack, damage, or unauthorized access. This includes measures to prevent cyber attacks, such as network security, endpoint security, and application security, as well as incident response and recovery efforts in the event of a successful attack. Cybersecurity is an important concern for individuals, businesses, and governments as the increasing reliance on technology and the internet has made it more likely that sensitive information will be compromised. Do you agree? I don't disagree. <laughs> I, I think it's a, a solid answer, but you can take it a step further. This is where we're going to bump into the more creative side of ChatGPT. Do it again, but say, explain cybersecurity to a five-year-old. Explain cybersecurity to a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. Let's see. By the way, anyone that's using ChatGPT, sometimes it goes down. It does. Be patient while it comes back up. <laughs> but this prompt says cybersecurity is like having a secret code to keep bad people from getting into your computer or phone. Just like how you would have locks on your door to keep strangers out of your house, cybersecurity helps protect your electronic devices from being hacked or broken into. It's important to keep your secret code safe and to not share with anyone you don't trust. Just like you wouldn't give a stranger the keys to your house. So I think that would be great for a password, like what a <laughs> password is. But still, I think in the, the spirit of what it is, I think it's a fantastic start. It's pretty good. I like how it's giving a lot of references mm -hmm. and examples to a stranger. And even though it says cybersecurity is a safe code, a secret code, I think that's still a good way to address it to a five-year-old. To Instead of saying data or mm -hmm. privacy and yeah secrets it's, it's a safe code yeah it's a safe code that you use to keep yourself safe don't give it to somebody so i <laughs> i think it's a decent lesson for a five-year-old but we're talking to adults right. i don't think there are many kids listening to our show <laughs> so what if we went into something like incident response right we all love doing incident response right because it takes us out of having fun with our families but <laughs> i would say that in order to do incident response sometimes you have to have a playbook Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't have a playbook because you haven't had time to. You're too busy fighting fires. But let's say your leader says, hey, write us a quick playbook for incident response. I think we could do it. What kind of incident response are we doing? Are we doing cloud incident response? Are we doing on-prem? Write me a playbook for incident response with relation to a denial of service attack against my public facing website. Write out steps and tips for each. I already know that this response is going to be good. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting this feeling that it's going to take information from somewhere out there like NIST, somewhere like CIS and, right. and give you the like a culmination of the best practices. But here's what we got is actually really good. The first step is identification. This is really common in any incident response playbook. Mm -hmm. You want to first identify the service or system that's under attack. The second bit is containment. Once the attack has been identified, then to contain it from accessing other systems. The third bit is eradication. After the attack, remove the cause of the attack. You know, this would be finding part of the root cause, if not the entire root cause, and starting to eliminate that infection or compromise. Yep. And then the fourth bit is recovery. After the attack has been eradicated, restore everything back to its normal service and operations. Mm -hmm. I would say that's pretty good for just about every classic like intrusion. Is it the best use case for denial of service? Probably not. No, because right. this is talking about eradication. Denial yeah. of service is typically coming from external sources. Mm -hmm. I guess you could eradicate with firewall rules, but it's not really eradicating because they might still be sending you that traffic, mm -hmm. but you're just blocking at that point. Right. It might be the, the situation where it's pulling from like the very old school, bare bones, best practices from back in the day. Let's try to do give us a playbook for incident response in cloud infrastructure. This is even harder, in my opinion. So we'll, we'll see what it comes up with. See, it's very similar. We just asked it to give us this playbook. And now it's giving us the same set of steps that it gave us on the last question. Mm -hmm. Makes me think. 
Yes, chat GPT is really great, but maybe it's not great at cybersecurity yet. I think cybersecurity professionals have nothing to be concerned about when it comes to <laughs> building better incident response playbooks than they can by just going to training and reading books. Let's give it another task. Have it act as if it is a CISO and a mid-size financial services company. And what we'll do is we can ask it questions to see what it will respond as with this persona in mind. All right, ChatGPT just responded. It is now a CISO for a <laughs> yeah. mid-sized financial <laughs> services company. And it's even giving out several key actions that it would take as the chief information security officer. That's pretty cool that it didn't, we didn't really even ask it that. Yeah. And it just said, you know what? I'm gonna give you a little bit of extra information. One of the cool things that you showed me with ChatGPT is that you can then take this prompt and this fictitious character and start asking it questions. Mm -hmm. You know, we really pride ourselves on being creative in cybersecurity. So right. I think it would only be right if we asked it a question that might help us day in and day out. Mm -hmm. And we create content. We spend a lot of time on planning our episodes. Let's go ahead and ask it a question about how it would create cybersecurity episodes mm. in relation to chat GPT. I love it. Let's do it. All right. Let's check out episode one, uncovering fraud with chat GPT. Okay. There's a little bit of a introduction here. The introduction, the concepts of using language models like chat GPT for cybersecurity and explain how it can help uncover fraud. Use case one. Phishing scam detection. Explain how ChatGPT can be used to analyze large amounts of email data to detect and flag phishing scams. That's pretty good. Use case number two, identifying insider threats. Oh, how's it going to do that? Explain how ChatGPT can be used to analyze employee communications and behavior. I don't know how everyone else is going to feel about that one. <laughs> and then use case number three is uh, automating penetration testing. Explain how ChatGPT can be used to automate penetration testing by generating natural language scripts that can be used to test the security of web applications. I think that's a pretty good use case. For I like that one. Oh, yeah. And I actually really like these examples that it gave us. They're a little weird. They <laughs> might not be directly one to one great episodes for chat GPT. But this is what I think it's really great at is the idea generation part. It exactly. gives you ideas. It gives you a base what to work off of when you give it the prompt. And you're right. It can generate code. Mm -hmm. I will be honest. We did just release a new iteration of the Hacker Valley Studio website. Mm -hmm. And I did use ChatGPT to help me build hey, it. Hey, use what you got, all right? It's a resource. <laughs> exactly. There's a great uh, technology called Copilot. I think it's actually created by GitHub. And as you're typing into VS Code, and maybe it integrates with other editors as well, but in VS Code, as you're typing in your code, it will autocomplete and give you suggestions. And not mm -hmm. just one line like how Grammarly would do. It will give you an entire code block. And if you type in, I want to create a module for the navigation bar on my website, mm -hmm. it will write out all the code for what it thinks you want out of a navigation bar. Mm. So what do you want ChatGPT to create for you? You have, have had this on and off relationship with Python and, right, and coding. Yeah. So if you were going to start the relationship again, what yeah. would you ask it? I would ask it to create some script that would help me in my day to day work. Right. We create content quite often. Sometimes we have to pull, I don't know, headlines from a website. A bleeping computer is one of my favorite resources for cybersecurity. Maybe I wanted to pull the headlines for the day from yeah. bleepingcomputer.com. Let's ask it. Write a Python script to pull the headlines from bleepingcomputer.com. All right, this is pretty nonspecific. You didn't tell it to scrape the HTML. You didn't tell right. it to connect to an API. Let's mm -hmm. see what it decides. I am pretty surprised. I'm pretty surprised because I believe this will work. <laughs> and we, we could go ahead and give it a shot as well because we have Python on my laptop. We could, we could drop this into the interpreter. But what it's doing is it, it imported a few Python libraries, one for pooling website information is called a uh, request library in Python. And then also another library called beautiful soup. And I remember using beautiful soup back in the day when I was doing a lot of website scraping mm -hmm. before there was a ton of APIs out there. And beautiful soup will allow you to look at the HTML and grab specific artifacts. Yep. So what the Python script is telling us to do is to grab the H2 
which is the mm-hmm. secondary heading, and then to print it out. So let's go ahead and give it a shot. Let's give it a shot. Womp, womp, womp. Mm. It does not work out of the box. Right. But what I love about Chat GPT and what it did here is it gave us a template to work off of. Mm. There are some things that I think we're, are, are going to need to be changed just because of the way that it's pulling the HTML. But it's it's really close. If you yeah. just put five to ten minutes into this script, I think anybody would be able to pull all of the headlines directly from this resource. Yeah, but imagine if you were someone that was just getting into it, right? You don't really know all the pieces that you might need, but at least this gives you a starting point to then massage it into something that's actually usable. Exactly. I was recently watching a podcast with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he was commenting on Chat GPT, and he said, "I'm not worried about Chat GPT outsmarting humans because mm-hmm. the only benefit that AI has for us is augmenting information for us. It's right. not going to be able to learn for you. It's not going to be able to make you more smart or more intelligent. If you use chat GPT to make yourself look more intelligent, I mean, it's almost like acting like a plagiarist. You're not mm-hmm. citing your sources. You're not creating your own original and unique work. Right. I think if you use something like chat GPT, you got to use it as a reference. And, and a if reference, you don't yeah. use it just as a reference, then you got to cite your work because it might not work as you expect. And you don't want this to be a representation of you if it's really not. Right. Yeah, you definitely have to use it as a base. I think a lot of folks are just using it straight from ChatGPT and posting it online, Right. which people can tell, right? You can do as much as you want with the voice, style, and tone. But I think at the end of the day, like you have to sound like you. You have to sound authentic. Yeah. Sure, you could use it for making things bigger, like we were talking about earlier, right? Taking something simple and say, hey, expand this out into a paragraph. Or perhaps maybe give me some high level listings for my course that I'm creating on malware analysis. But I wouldn't say make the whole course straight from AI. (laughs) I think it could also do something creative. Mm -hmm. What if we did write me a short poem about cybersecurity? Let's see what it would come out with. Cyber threats loom in the dark, silent and stealthy like a shark. Our data and systems at risk, we must protect them, our top disk. Firewalls and passwords, our first line of defense, but we must stay vigilant with no pretense. Phishing scams and malware, we must be aware. In this digital age, we must turn the page, stay informed and stay secure, cybersecurity, our future. Wow. Not bad. I love it. (laughs) And AI wrote this. AI wrote that. This is better than the code, if you ask me. (laughs) It's better than that. I (laughs) agree. I think it's much better for stuff like that, because I do think there are nuances, especially when it comes to code. There are nuances where it comes to really technical information. Sometimes it'll produce information that's actually incorrect, right? It might pull from a point that's really, really old. It might even bring two different data points and pull them together. So you have to always do your additional research, Mm -hmm. your additional massaging. But I do think for creative stuff, it's much easier. We have some news to share with you, a member of the Hacker Valley Media family. As of 2023, we became a full-time independent cybersecurity media company, and we're committed to bringing you the most powerful, thought-provoking stories in the field of cybersecurity. And we learned we can't do it alone. We'd love to invite you to our exclusive Patreon community, where we host a monthly mastermind where you can meet like-minded individuals in the field of cybersecurity that are trying to be more creative and be the best version of themselves that they can be. We would love if you took a second and visited patreon.com forward slash Hacker Valley Studio, and we'll see you in the mastermind. We got to keep on this topic of being creative because I think mm-hmm. being a creator and being creative is almost a a necessity in cybersecurity. You look at people that are creating courses. Everyone's creating a LinkedIn course now, mm-hmm. LinkedIn Everybody. learning course. Yeah. And you look at YouTube videos, you look at conferences, you look at webinars, you look at anything that a cybersecurity practitioner has to do. A big part of it is teaching. 100%. And I think being creative and using something like ChatGPT is something that will help you get the edge in being creative. But you also had this topic, this idea that you 
coined and created called mm-hmm. Industry Creative. Yep. What exactly is it? I saw your LinkedIn newsletter. Yeah. I wanted to bring it up here on this episode because I think it's it's so important and relevant to like everything that we're seeing in the field today. I'm glad you brought it up. And, and yeah, it's something that's kind of my little pet project of, of coining this term Industry Creative. Think influencer, right? When right. you think influencer these days, honestly, some people even get kind of a negative reaction because they think entitled people that have too much money for they get the almost, ick. Yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, another another one of these <laughs> another, guys. Another influencer. <laughs> but when you look at what an influencer is at its bare bones, the the value that an influencer has is the followership, right? Right. Usually in numbers. But when I look at something like industry creative, it's about the body of work that this person has done in their past. So you and I, we spent a long time in cybersecurity, really in the trenches, fighting all the fights, seeing all the challenges, seeing all the successes. And then we became creators. Mm -hmm. I think when you do that, when you make that transition, it makes you a much powerful creator when you can say like i'm pulling from authentic experiences sometimes you get folks that come into say cybersecurity marketing and they're doing their best work right because they're great but they might not have the necessary context behind everything that goes into the world of a cybersecurity practitioner definitely not and usually they have to talk to people but what you could do is have someone that is of that world someone that has lived that life that is helping you create that content why does the industry need this? I had my own suspicions and you know said that I think cybersecurity practitioners are teachers, but why do we need yet another term like industry creative? I think Gary Vee said it best. Every company is going to have to become a media company. And mm-hmm. with everyone looking to create content, you're going to have to have this nexus of industry knowledge and creativity and putting them together. The best case scenario is having someone that can do both. So creating and cultivating this sort of environment where someone can learn storytelling, someone can learn how to create a podcast, how can someone learn to put out uh, videos on YouTube, then that person has all the power that they need to create that content. I think it's limiting when you just have someone that just does the work and then someone that just creates. Mm -hmm. When you're the same person, it makes it easier. When you look at any company nowadays... A lot of them have podcasts. A lot of them have social media, if Mm -hmm. not all of them at this point. I don't know any companies that don't have a social media page. But, you know, all of these things are really a media company. These are Mm -hmm. things that media agencies produce day in and day out. Videos, podcasts, companies are turning into publication sources. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that really happened was honestly social media. Social media gave us connection to everyone Mm -hmm. all over the world. And so originally, you know, we think easily, oh, uh, B2C, that makes sense. We have all these people that are using Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. So we got to market to those people. But then B2B, you know, business to business companies, they thought, couldn't we do the same thing? And then how do we do that in an authentic way? So then they started writing white papers. They started Mm -hmm. doing email campaigns. They started doing all this stuff, trying to reach everybody. But what people are finding is that when it doesn't come from a place of authenticity, when you don't really empathize with the practitioner, you don't really know what they do on a day-to-day basis, the messaging usually comes across hollow. Yeah. But if you have someone that really has been there, they've heard all the issues, the scenarios, they've lived it, it comes from a place of authenticity and it connects with that audience. For a while, we would hear of this term security evangelist Mm -hmm. and it kind of came and went and for good reason, because a lot of the time sales and marketing, you know, they'll employ something like an industry creative or they'll call it an evangelist. And then after about a few weeks, they'll start to ask them to only focus on the product, Mm -hmm. only make new content that's relevant and that revolves around the product. So how do organizations and companies get what they need, which is leads, Mm -hmm. opportunity, sales, while also not getting too singular and focused on just hyping up their product through their industry creative. You hit on two problems. The first problem is with the the old kind of security evangelist model. It's usually people pontificating about like theories, right? Just standing up on stage and just talking about things. When I'm thinking about industry creative, I'm thinking about someone that's producing content that's going to be usable and digestible for people out there. What can they use from their for their day to day work? right? They're going to run into problems. What are the solutions to those problems? Right. If you have someone that just kind of like theorizes and maybe does some inspirational stuff that has its place, but an industry creative is creating content that's going to help someone in their work 
from a day-to-day -day perspective. The second thing you mentioned was about the products. That's the other issue, right? Uh, I mentioned Gary Vee once before, I'll mention him again. He's all about giving, 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 then you ask. Mm. When we put out marketing for our companies, technology, cybersecurity, whatever, if you're always asking for stuff, people are less likely to help you. But buy you my do, product, right, start buy to it. do a demo. Mm -hmm. hey, let's <laughs> let's go, go into the demo. But the role of the industry creative, they're not so focused on, hey, I'm gonna get these leads. The leads will come. They're not so focused on getting people into the funnel. The funnel will get filled, but the value of the industry creative is to provide very actionable and valuable context to the audience. You build that relationship. And then sure, maybe eventually that industry creative might ask for something in return, but the focus is on giving. You know what I love about that is when you look at any technology in cybersecurity, whether it's EDR, whether it's threat intelligence, whether it's security automation, vendors are out there because they are able to simplify the technology or the idea down to a UI. Right. And that's the beauty of it. A lot of times I think vendors get worried if I give out steps one through four, mm -hmm. even though there's a hundred steps that my product does, right. if I give out steps one through four, that's giving out my secret sauce. We don't mm -hmm. want our competitors to have that competitive edge that we have. Right. And I think that's a miss because if you give people how you even built your product, if you give them that information, 99.9% .9 of people don't have the skills, time or resources to build what you've built right. because you've taken the time out of your day. They mm -hmm. have their own life circumstance and right. situation and things going on that if you give out information and you are like leaders in a, a very specific cybersecurity domain, mm -hmm. you're gonna have so much success. What is that price that you think companies have to pay, whether it's expertise, paying top dollar for practitioners, maybe it's time. What is that price that you have to pay to be successful as an industry creative? So there, there's two ways to look at that. There's looking at it from what is the price to pay as a individual that's trying to become an industry creative? And then what is the price to pay for a company that wants to have a creative uh, industry creative in their company? The first one is putting in the work mm -hmm. for that trade craft that you're trying to develop. If you're going into YouTube video creation, then really get smart on YouTube. What are the best YouTubers doing in that space? And then you're going to apply cybersecurity, you're going to apply technology, you're going to apply artificial intelligence, whatever that industry that you're in, you're going to apply those learnings to that. So simultaneously, you're trying to distill the information that you have and make it really simple for people to understand, but then understand the best practices for developing that content. So you're gonna run that parallel to one another. If you're a company, the thing is you're gonna to have to put both time and resources into creating the content because creating content takes time. I wish it just, we could just on a dime- <laughs> Chat start, GPT. Yeah, chat <laughs> GPT, you know, spin up a new podcast and have it be, you know, go viral, but that's just not the reality. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes resources, and it honestly does take expertise in the field in which you're trying to reach. It sounds like you're giving the masterclass. <laughs> I'm waiting for the book and yeah. also the how-to video. <laughs> yeah. Would you consider yourself uh, an industry creative? Absolutely. I would uh, consider myself an industry creative because I spent the majority of my time as a practitioner and as a leader in cybersecurity. But 2019, when we started the podcast, we started to deliver that content, deliver that creative product to our community. Right. And we didn't do it to make money. We did it because we wanted to help people. And keeping that same vein and growing the business, growing the network, growing the agency, I feel like we are the creative, you know, one of the industry creatives in our field. We make content for our field from our field. Mm -hmm. You're an industry creative. I'm an industry creative as well. And I think the, the best part about any story, especially being something like an industry creative is to reflect on who you were before and who you are today. So how would you describe how you've changed as a person after becoming an industry creative? So just for a little bit of context for everybody, you know, I was at the National Security Agency where you can't really talk a lot about your work at all, like, <laughs> at all. I would do presentations inside the agency, but anything external just didn't happen. Started my own company, got away from the cleared work, and I just started to work in threat intelligence for the commercial uh, industry. And then I found myself at uh, SANS CTI Summit and they 
did a call out for, hey, uh, we have a little extra time. Uh, we have a slot for four or five people come up for a five minute lightning talk. Mm. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I should give it a shot. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable on stage, but I don't have anything prepared, but I'll just figure something out. And so I wrote a, uh, a, a quick script on the back of a, a note card uh, talking about taking your stakeholders and turning them into champions from a threat intelligence perspective. Because sometimes there are practitioners that don't want to use threat intel folks. They're mm -hmm. like, oh, it's snake oil, don't want to use it. Right. But how do you turn stakeholders into champions of your work? So I got up on stage, did the five minute dialogue, and uh, Jen Santiago came up to me after. She was like, wow, you're, you're pretty good. Like, we should definitely stay in contact. And that's when it really began, began for me. I was like, you know what? That felt pretty good. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should go on a tear and do more speaking engagements. Right. And then that's really where I got bit by the bug and went to work. It's pretty much the same for me. Jennifer Santiago, for anyone that doesn't know her, definitely look her up on LinkedIn. She has enabled so many people to elevate their game talking at SANS mm -hmm. events including ourselves. Yep, 100%. Looking at the future, like what should the listener know and keep on the lookout when it comes to industry creative? Like, especially if they wanted to be one, what is that piece of advice that you'd have to step into that role of an industry creative? What I'd recommend to people first is become an industry creative because I do see a world in which the better you are as an industry creative, the more power you're gonna have in your career. Right. I think if you had 20 industry creatives right now in any discipline that were experts in their field and they created great content, if they were in a layoff situation, they would automatically get a new job like that. That's just my, just my uh, opinion, but I do think that's the case. I think more people need to understand that creating content takes time, developing the muscles and the skills to make quality content takes time, you're not going to have an audience immediately. Figuring out who you want to speak to is super important. And then just putting in the time. Mm -hmm. People, they get into podcasting. Pod fade usually happens at episode seven. Get to episode 10. <laughs> reassess. Like, hey, this is going pretty good. Get to episode 50, 100, 500, 1,000. When you put in that much time as an industry creative, whatever that, that field is, the better you're going to be in that space. So I would say figure out who you want to talk to. What is that expertise that you can bring to the table for your community? And then what is that medium that you're going to get really sharp in to be able to do that? Oh, yeah. And we've had hundreds of people come on the podcast. And one thing that always comes up is community mm -hmm. and building a network. So yeah. we believe it's important not to put people on an island and try to build a community from scratch every time. Mm -hmm. We did it with our Patreon. We have a mastermind group and we do a monthly mastermind. It's a creative mastermind. We bring people together for an hour out of the month and share and bounce ideas off of each other. If you're interested, we would love for you to check it out. It's patreon.com forward slash Hacker Valley Studio. And it is a monthly event. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Definitely hang out if you can. And with that, we will see everyone next time. <laughs>